We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Bob Coleman from Idaho Armored Vaults. Thanks for joining me today, Bob. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Excellent. Good to uh, good to have you back. And I thought it would be a good time to to chat with you here coming into the end of the year. I've spoken to you many times here. You're so knowledgeable on all kinds of topics, but I thought it would be kind of good to, you know, look at the year that we had here. And maybe we could start by talking a little bit about, you know, the 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 premiums that we saw on on gold and maybe we'll talk about gold and silver separately but like let's let's start with talking about what we saw for demand in the in the retail you know coin and bar areas and and how you saw premiums sort of progress through the year for let's start with gold sure well the 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 squeeze or i guess the movement that happened earlier this year obviously had a huge effect on retail uh, uh, demand and also on retail product. It just took the market, I think, sort of uh, uh, b- by by storm, I guess. It, it, you had a few follow up the, the prior couple of years before that. You know, pre COVID, you know, the industry was very quiet. You had consolidation in the industry. You didn't have as much refinery action and so forth. So when this big tidal wave came of demand, it it really caught a lot of the players off guard or the or the refiners especially with you talk about you know the effects of covid transportation logistics production social distancing that type of thing so that just made that that compounded the issues and then on top of compounding that you had the bigger issue of the price was so low or perceived to be so low you just weren't getting people selling metal back into the market so the only real true supply that was available was new newly minted product versus two-way market where you had people selling back supply you know, in, in a normal fashion. So, and, and it, that's what you kind of have when you had the Fed print as much money as they did, expand their balance sheet, the debt creation that the US government's taken on, the spending programs, that type of thing. All that has sort of registered in people's minds that, well, wait a second, this usually ends in an inflationary melt-up. Uh, and of course, that's what we've been seeing, oddly enough, is that the the physical world or the real world has been seeing an increase in prices, but the paper side, for some reason, uh, or at least the, the prices of gold and silver have been very stagnant. In fact, I mean, we find it odd that the U.S. dollar has actually outperformed gold this year. Yeah, that's pretty crazy to think about that the the dollar has outperformed gold, and obviously that is a acts as a, a major headwind for the prices. So, have these basic, you know, premiums rising and, and shortness of supply. Has this basically been a, a theme since, you know, March of 2020 when when the lockdowns began and you you really saw demand kind of spike? Yeah, I think with that increase in demand, you had an industry that was very dormant, losing money uh, the prior few years. Uh, so I think it was an opportunity that some of the, that the, the industry in general saw a chance to make back a lot of money that was maybe lost or 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 maybe the opportunity cost, you should say. Um, and then you had greed set in. You had you know extraordinary markups on products. Uh, you had the obviously the, the blowouts with spot prices. Um, you know between London and New York, you you had issues with uh, online dealers posting spot prices that weren't actually the spot price they were marked up um so you had you had you know and the consumer was basically a buyer beware type of situation you know they they came into the market they saw all the money printing they they knew they wanted metals to protect themselves but uh the i think the you know part of the industry saw that and they were able to mark up that product knowing that uh, that product was in demand, whether or not that price is going to be, you know, an extra fifty cents an ounce or four dollars an ounce. Uh, mm-hmm. The the market was going to be there, and that was a shame because for the industry itself, for the consumer, a lot of people ended up buying when silver was at twenty eight, for example. Uh, they were buying thirteen or fifteen dollars an ounce premium on you know different types of silver products, 
uh, you know, that price now has to get to forty five dollars an ounce before they can break even. And that's you know, given that as that price starts to rise, you know, let's say you get the thirty five dollar silver, for example, you're going to start to see secondary supply start to come back on the market. People that had bought maybe 10 years ago uh, mm -hmm. at, at, at thirty dollars and they said, you know, now it's at thirty five. I've waited a long time. Yeah, I'm going to get my money back out and move on with my life. Well, that's that type of supply is going to hamper the premiums. It's going to it's going to, the dealers are going to drop their bid prices uh, and that's going to impact when the next round of wave or, or the next wave of people that come in and start selling, you know, that may have just bought in the last couple of years. They're going to get a sticker shock when they realize that it may be, uh, you know, that seven dollar or eight dollar premium or thirteen dollar premium they paid for. It, they may just get spot for their product. Mm -hmm. So did you see, you know, silver premiums really exceed what, what happened on gold simply because silver seems to be much more attainable for the average person and they can get a lot more of it? Yeah, it's a smaller market. Uh, you're right. It, it, it's um, a lot more money that comes or, or money that comes into the silver market certainly has a bigger dent. Uh, than the gold market. Gold's just much more expensive. It's you know right now eighty to one, for example, the ratio. So you have that multiplying effect. Whereas you know with silver, um, it's it's bulky. It costs money to move. It's it's you know you have to make so much more of it uh, to to meet the demand. So you have those types of um, uh, uh, I guess outlying effects that that force that price of silver or the mark the the markup that can come into silver typically comes into play because you have insurance and shipping and logistics and you know that type of thing. So there's a little bit more there's a little bit more to it with silver than with gold. Um, mm -hmm. but it, but the I think the the sad part about the silver side is the the incredible markups that I think took place. Yes, dealers expanded their operations, they paid employees, they have they have underlying costs. I totally get it. They have to make money totally for that. Uh, not saying that you know the dealers shouldn't make any money at all. They definitely should. Um, the issue is how much and how much does that cost hit the investor uh, and their opportunity to turn around and make money themselves? And that's and that's the part that uh you know, you, I look for, you know, with, with our client base and cu customer base is that's part of the education that I provide to, to, to individuals is uh, selling them, uh, you know, a product or uh, th that they can certainly turn around and that's not costing them an arm and leg to get into. Mm -hmm. So, you know, considering the, the higher premiums on, let's say $28 silver, you, you, you think that that's going to act as a, as a real headwind to break that, let's say $35, $40 level once we get there as well? Yeah, I think if we break through 30, um, you have sort of almost a lot of hot air between 30 and almost $48. Uh, I mean, you could see a very big spike uh, start to set in. And that's typically how silver moves. It never moves in a straight line. It takes forever to make its it, its its uh, ascent or you know, grinds and grinds, and then it just takes off like a rocket. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you get past 30, I think you'll have a lot of potential short covering that comes in. You know, funds may be, you know, they may be set on the wrong side or uh, it, Typically, silver always tends to catch somebody off guard. The the, the you know it may be hedgers uh, on you know for for produ producers that are using the futures market to hedge you know their mining production. Certainly, that affected uh, you know when gold ran in two thousand eight to two thousand eleven. You had uh, a lot of mining companies losing money on their on their hedge books. Um, mm -hmm. So so that may be the impetus that 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 happens. Um, but yeah, it's it's or it could be, you know, at least, you know, if the if the market starts to take off, it could also be where people that have leased metal that needs to pay that that needs to get that metal back. They may have to pay any price to get that metal back. There could be different types of situations, whether for collateralization, financing or just simply raw supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So it almost seems, seems that there's there's bigger forces on the demand side to create upward pressure rather than that secondary market coming back in um, to act as the headwind then. 
Yeah, the, the, the secondary market, I think, will only bring pressure from the premium standpoint. Mm-hmm. It's not gonna, it's not really going to affect the spot price as much because typically you're dealing more with retail product. You're not dealing with thousand ounce silver bars, for example. So um, unless there's just a massive wave of scrap, a massive wave of retail product that hits uh, the wholesale level, the wholesale level then sends it to the refiners to melt for uh, uh, for the manufacturing uh, and industry side, mm-hmm. but I think I think you're just going to see the premiums get walloped. Um, uh, it, it, you may still see people buying metal, of course. It you know the the uh, you know the the Western investor, Western Hemisphere investor, typically buys when the prices are going up, unlike the, the Eastern Hemisphere. So. Um, you know, nobody could care less at you know silver at 15, but if silver's at 35, you'll probably have everybody wrapped around the corner. It's just that mm-hmm. it's human nature. So you'll certainly get buying. It's just the question is, it won't be re- solely reliant on brand new metal uh, that's coming into the market. I think you'll see that that dichotomy or shift that'll mm-hmm. bring, it, and it it's well needed because it'll it'll help relieve some of that premium pressure. It'll allow people to get in at better prices. Um, and it'll probably create a little bit truer market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the different different forces at play there. So you you mentioned the the thousand ounce bar market, and I, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts there as well. Of of you know if we actually did start to see some tightness in the market, and I, I know that we we've seen um, you know for for example the Sunshine Mint and the the U.S. Mint not being able to produce some some silver rounds and silver eagles, so you know, where did we actually see market tightness and and um, what were some of the symptoms and causes of it? Well, just recently, the last probably couple of weeks, you've seen a tick up in premiums uh, or or the price of thousand ounce bars. They've gone up probably about um, you know, maybe 10 cents an ounce. Not a lot, but it's gone up. It's just, there's a little bit of tightness. The EFP is tightening up a little bit. So there shows that there's some tightness in the system. Now, some of that could be simply logistics and production issues, moving those bars from point A to point B. Um, that's typical this time of year. You have holidays, which is a nightmare. You have uh, not just from a congestion of, of shipping, but you also have vacations. The European uh, market tends to take you know, a week to probably two weeks off. <laughs> um, so you have you have um, just a, a, a numerous uh, uh, activities that are going on all at the same time. You have retooling that happens. You have crossover in your production from 2021 to 2022. So you have that delay as they shift production. So you, you, there's a number of different things that are going on. Mm-hmm. Um, that that has also started to tick up some of the premiums in some of the sovereign coin markets. Um, you've seen uh, the uh, some of the European mints are having issues with blanks and production. Uh, there was some social uh, distancing. I think uh, the Austrian mint uh, and the Royal Mint, I believe, had uh, COVID outbreaks. Um, so you have some social dis- social distancing issues that that's going on over there, from what I've heard. Um, so that's hampering production big time. Uh, the issue is how much product can some of these mints uh, make and ship out during January, because a lot of these wholesalers, as you see. Um, you know, the market start to pick up because prices go down and get p- people buying on dips. You know, they may have bought a lot of product. And like we saw throughout, you know, the last year and a half, it may be a situation that the mint says, well, you know what, with all the social distancing and all these other issues, we can't make as much product as we thought we were going to make. So that may put some of the uh, industry short metal. And I think that's what possibly could happen in January. And that's mm-hmm. That's another thing to consider because that could put pressure on, uh, you know, on pr- if prices start to rise because some players may have to go out and buy the the, the metal anywhere they can get it just to cover their transaction. Mm-hmm. So, what about in the in the thousand ounce bar market? Did we ever really see any any shortness or tightness there? And and what were maybe some of the symptoms of it? Yeah, I you, you started to see that earlier this year. You saw the FP uh, the premium go up. Um, you, you had obviously you had the record premiums for thousand ounce bars that were coming into the market. 
if I could sum up sort of the first half of the year, and if you ask me, well, why did this silver movement or why did this uh, this retail um, uh, stranglehold on product and 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 demand die off? Um, mm-hmm. I think you could really look at the premiums. The premiums, you know, they always say the cure for high prices is high prices. Well, in this situation, the premiums were so crazy going into May uh, and early June, April, May, June is when they kind of peaked. But the reason for that is that the U.S. Mint was making a crossover into the Type 2 coin. They were changing the series design and so forth. And mm-hmm. so you had a complete like one whole product, which happened to be the largest product for the market uh, on the retail side, just cut off. So it was it was a flood into other products. Um, and then the premiums were going up. The, the uh, dealers were charging absorbent rates. Uh, you know, the, the wholesalers were were uh, having to, to charge higher rates as well. Well, investors just got tired. Uh, mm-hmm. They didn't they didn't see the value in paying a massive price above spot, uh, knowing that they have to overcome that price at some point. So, di- the, the 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 market started to just simply tail off. And then you started to see the price plateau, and then the premium started to subside, and then uh, you know it got just really quiet over the summer. That, that's pretty much what killed the market. Um, otherwise, if I think if the premiums weren't as high as they were, I think you would have st- you would have seen more interest uh, start to expand from the public. Uh, it's just I think people just yeah. You know, I talked to a lot of people back then, and they were like. It just doesn't make any, make any sense paying seven dollars over spot for a coin that was maybe selling for two dollars over spot in the wholesale market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. There's you know that's a a huge hurdle for a new investor to the space to to get over. Well, and you got to remember the, the new investor that was coming into the market. It wasn't your traditional um, uh, uh, retail. Uh, metals uh, um, stacker, I could, should say. You know, the, the people that were coming into the market were really first-time buyers. It was people that had your traditional mainstream portfolios. You know, sixty percent, seventy percent stocks, thirty percent bonds, whatever the mix. You know, mix of real estate, but they never really had any type of exposure to precious metals. So, you know, a guy that had a million dollar portfolio, he wanted to put you know a hundred thousand into to gold or silver. He'd never done that before. Those are the kind of people that came into the market, and they're the ones who ended up paying a lot because they just didn't understand the market. They they weren't truly educated in, you know, how to shop around or, or you know, the, you know, they listened to you know on YouTube or on Twitter or or some other type of forum to try and pick up information, and they heard a guy they they kind of got okay, like that makes sense. I'll just buy a metal from him. But but that's where um, a lot of people got trapped. I mean, they were just paying vastly over uh over spot for for product um and so that's that's where uh that that started to hit the market and people by the summer just got you know they did their first tranche they bought into it they really felt comfortable but then they looked at the price they looked at how much over spot they paid and they're like wait a second this doesn't make any sense because now instead of trying to protect my purchasing power i just gave all my purchasing power to it you know to the markup in the product so on the other side of that, when we when we think about the let's say unallocated and, and pooled type programs that don't carry that you know exorbitant premium on top of them, those definitely look more attractive to to your average new investor. So you know we haven't really touched on that in a little while, and I, I just want to kind of go over that again and and you know talk a little bit about the the risks of some of these programs and. Why they are so attractive, but the the risks that are associated with them, right? Yeah, I think if you look at, well, there was a new uh, breed of program that has popped up. Not really new, but it's just a, a different angle on it. Some of the retail dealers have created these commingled bar programs or balance sheet financing programs, kind of like unallocated type of programs where. Uh, they're getting, you know, when premiums are really high, they created this, hey, listen, I'm going to create a thousand ounce bar program. You can buy a part of that bar, get some exposure to silver, your premiums and instead of spending, you know, you know, $10 an ounce on a one ounce coin, for example, you can spend, you know, a, you know, 
two dollars, three dollars an ounce on a thousand ounce bar program. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, if you ever want to take delivery of it, um, you'd have to convert that into another retail product and pay the commission on that retail product. Um, and so you you saw a lot of that come out. I think people looked at that really quickly and said, well, wait a second, that's just simply just like an unallocated program. So you're right. The 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 some of the things, the, 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 of course, then you had the issue with, I believe you had a, the purse bent uh, uh, concerns and so forth. And I think there's some other unallocated programs out there that people have concerns over. People started to wisen up to the fact that, well, wait a second, if the one thing that, that, the, that the, the silver squeeze movement did was it kind of put into this um, limelight the ability to take delivery uh, and to actually get physical metal when you want your physical metal. Mm -hmm. And so I think these unallocated programs, it started to, which I've been preaching since 2008, that these programs are not your best friend. Uh, in fact, they're not your friend at all. Mm -hmm. They're just, they take uh, people's money, they use that money to finance their balance sheet. Uh, and then, you know, you have basically a representation of, of price of the metal. They still have the obligation to pay you back. You know, if silver doubles in price, they still have to manage their business and always have that inventory sort of floating to ultimately pay you back. And it works until it doesn't. And, mm -hmm. and the problem is if if you get into a tight market, you can have lease rates go up. You can have the ability to get, you know, you may sell metal into the market, but to then go out and find that metal to replace the metal you just sold becomes a challenging issue. And I think that started to, to raise questions. Mm -hmm. So, so, th th so the, the unallocated, um, uh, I think people started to become aware of allocated uh, metal programs as well. Those are, those have always been a concern for me because 90%, I think, of the industry is probably more allocated based. Um, um, and so what people don't understand with allocated positions is that also can be a commingled bar ownership program. It can be also a um, some type of uh, balance sheet financing type of program. It doesn't always mean that your 10 ounces of silver is put aside with your name on it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's more of a balance sheet uh, or, or a spreadsheet type of um, uh, approach where uh, you have basically a percentage or you have a stated number of ounces as part of this thousand ounce bar uh, for the most part. You, you, know, you see a lot of these with gold or silver to the nearest gram or to the ne nearest troy ounce, whatever it may be. So so when people, I think people started to, to kind of pick up on this type of language, there was a lot of people that started to, to talk about this type of stuff, which is great. I mean, education is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. But I think uh, as people started to become aware of this, they started saying, well, wait a second, I'm getting, I'm not getting charged anything for my unallocated storage account. Well, why is that? And I think people started to recognize that, you know, maybe there isn't a free lunch out there. So that started to change. I think if if you want to look at the 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 programs out there to try and identify whether your program is unallocated or allocated, just read the agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. It will state in there what kind of program it actually is. Um, it may be a little bit legal, jar some legal jargon in there, but typically, if you're if their marketing says it's a segregated account, where in a segregated situation, your metal is held separate and apart from everybody else in the vault. It'll say that right in the agreement, but if the media, if if their advertising says segregated, but the but the storage agreement doesn't have the word segregated anywhere in the agreement, you have to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it may just be truly just an allocated program, and I see the the terminology allocated segregated a lot out there in the advertising world. And there's really no such thing as allocated segregated. In that realm, what you basically have is a program that stores at a third party custodian, for example, Vault. Um, they have a master account. And in that master account, they control the metal. The sponsor controls that metal. The sub accounts uh, of that master account is record kept by the sponsor themselves. Um, and so the, the, the sub account or the client can't necessarily call up that third party vault custodian and say, hey, listen, I want my metal because the, the third party custodian won't know who they are. They, they haven't had an agreement signed with that third with that uh, sub that sub account. Mm -hmm. So in that realm, um, you have basically the client can only go through the sponsor to actually get access to their metal. So if something happens to the sponsor, 
that's just another uh, uh, you know, potential liability in that equation between the client and their metal. Um, mm -hmm. So that so that's something to understand when you're reading through these agreements is the the structure of which how they're created. So something that we talked about before with those types of programs is if any of that metal is basically rehypothecated to to other obligations. So do do those risks carry over to some of the ETFs as well, Bob? Yeah, I, I believe th th it's a very interesting question. There's a lot of two-way debate on this type of thing, whether or not the ETFs have the metal, whether or not there's there's um, there's actually truly ownership uh, it, with that metal. How much uh, recourse is there that the ET have it, the ETF has with the custodian that stores the metal? Um, certainly, but with and I've done I did some research on this. I put out a little uh, research report on Twitter. Um, I think it's also on our on our website. Um, but the the thing that stunned me was when you buy an ETF. Technically speaking, you don't even own the shares. When you hold that fund in street name, meaning you have it in your brokerage account, the broker doesn't even own those shares. The, 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 the actual owner is DTCC, or technically speaking, the shares are actually in the name of a subsidiary of DTCC, which is Seed and Company. So in that regard, you're a beneficial owner of the shares, but you're not the legal owner. Uh, uh, and so it gets really convoluted. So if you get into a systemic risk situation, um, the way that the whole system is structured is, is that DTCC, by owning all the shares, they can, you know, when, when someone wants to buy and another person wants to sell, they can actually make the transfer on their on their books. And it's it flows through nice and fine. You know, it's just like moving peas in a pea cup type of thing. You, you own all three cups. Eventually, everybody's going to get their shares, or at least it's going to be shown in their in their brokerage account that they have the shares. Mm -hmm. The problem you run into, though, is what happens when you have systemic risk entered into the situation. What happens, like we saw with GameStop, when the broker dealer starts to get into financial difficulties, and how much of a domino effect that has with other counterparties, and how does that actually start to, to fall the fallout from that? Well, the ETFs work in a very similar fashion. You have to look at the authorized participants. Their interaction with the ETFs, you know, what are they using the ETF for? You've had um, you've had uh, the equity or sorry, commodity trading trading desks over the last year and a half. A lot of the banks getting out of the commodity business and rolling their commodity structure into their equity trading or into their uh, foreign exchange foreign exchange trading desks. Well, on the equity side, if they plow their silver holdings into made delivery into the ETF and then in exchange, they took ETF shares. Well, now they're managing the ETF shares and they're not managing the the um, the metal itself anymore. So you have what are they doing with their shares? Are they arbing their shares out? Are they using them for collateralized financing? Are they putting on their books so that you know hedge funds can short against those shares and they collect, you know, they collect some type of interest for for lending those shares out. I mean, there's a whole slew of of intricacies that gets wrapped up with these ETFs. So so it's not as cut and dry as it is as when just simply owning a bar of metal in your hand, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, if that kind of helps, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, but you have with the ETFs, you have the metal is there. It's not the question of if the metal is there or not there. The, the issue is um, what type of situation is wrapped around the metal. Um, if, if uh, you know, for example, if the metal's held in a subcustodian, let's say JP Morgan is storing the gold, their, their vaults fill up. They now have to have a third party uh, or sub out that work to another custodian. And let's say that custodian loses all the metal. Well, under the LBMA rules uh, or the 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 English uh, um, um, the English rules uh, in terms of, of um, uh, recourse, the main custodian has no recourse to the sub custodian at all in case that metal gets stolen. In fact, actually, that's in the trust prospectus. The inability to get uh, to go after uh, metals that are lost in that type of situation. Well, the whole the whole reasoning behind that, because it makes no sense. Why would you store metals with a subcustodian, and then I had to have any recourse if that subcustodian loses all the metals? Well, 
it turns out that the subcustodian, I think when all this language and laws were written, is that the Bank of England was the third party or the subcustodian for all these other vaults out there over in London. And so you can't sue a sovereign government. You can't sue a sovereign uh, uh, government entity. So that makes the most sense. And that's why that language is in there. And so understanding that, you have to ask yourself, well, what happens if you have a run on the bank, so to speak, and people, you know, you start to see inflation really start to pick up like in Turkey and people say, you know what, maybe I want my metal or, or if I can't get it, I'm just going to start dumping shares of GLD and, you know, I just want to get out. Well, if you have a demand for gold coming into the market um, for physical and people want out of paper, you could see, you know, potentially that fund or whether it's closed in, open in. Uh, uh, I shouldn't say open end, but these ETFs, they could go to discounts to mm -hmm. NAV. And that and that's a risk people have to look at as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something that we try to talk about a lot on the show is to, you know, keep a, a broader perspective and ignore some of the, the short-term noise. But, you know, last week we saw Powell come out and actually announce the, the, the tapering schedule that they think that they're going to stick to here and and the the possible rate hikes that we're going to see. So this seems like kind of a a, a sea change of sorts that of of you know market reaction to a fed meeting. It was it was much different than a than a typical fed meeting. So how do you view the the tapering schedule and and what do you think we we see once we get the actual rate hikes? It's a, it's a, that's a very broad question. And I think it's, a, it has a, a, a multiple of answers here to it. Just to go back to a little bit of history in 2015, when gold was at 1050 an ounce and, mm -hmm. and, and it bottomed in December and it happened the bottom the day after the Fed raised rates for the first time since 2008. Um, oddly, gold finally started to go up when the Fed actually su signaled a tightening. Um, so sometimes the markets don't always act when you think they should act or why they should act when they should act. Um, but it turned out that the when they started the Titan, that started to force the or it started to create the drumbeat for this. Um, at some point, you know, the economy is going to start to to lose luster, or the financial markets are going to lose luster because they're not getting that quantitative easing or the balance sheet expansion for the Fed to buy. Treasuries, for example, to support the treasury market, which in turn supports, you know, keeps interest rates as low as possible. Well, um, gold kind of sensed that, uh, and it 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 started to pick up. Well, you fast forward to today with this tapering effect. Oddly enough, real rates are still very negative. Uh, unlike 2013, when everyone's looking at the chart in 2013, they're looking for the waterfall crash. I mean, I'm telling you, last week. The, the 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 negative sentiment was so so thick you could cut it with a knife. I mean, everyone was looking for 1675 gold. They were looking for sub 20 silver, um, pointing to the fact that wait a second, 2013 you had the you know everything go right off a cliff because you know the Fed was going to stop QE and and the game's over. Well. Mm -hmm. We're in a lot different situation. You have negative interest rates. They haven't turned. They haven't even turned up yet. You have a situation where consumer sentiment is actually in decline, unlike in 2013, where it had already declined and was trying to work its way back up. You, you have you have a, 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 a lot more debt out there. You know the debt servicing requirements are are, are you know become, can become a lot more uh, stringent in today's world than they were even just five seven years ago. So there's a lot of things that are happening that people need to 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 take note of. And the Fed right now is trying to. There's this window of opportunity. I think they see, um, and it, this may get a little bit confusing, but basically how interest rates have stayed so low for so long is that the Fed has been expanding their balance sheet. And with that balance sheet expansion, they've been buying about 100% of the treasury issuance um, for the last year and a half since, since March of 2020. Mm -hmm. That is what has kept interest rates low. It's not because of, you know, uh, you know, everyone believes in the bond market and it's the greatest thing in the world. It truly is a business. And if you look at the business and, and primary dealers and so forth are able to buy these treasuries and pawn them back off to the Fed and, and that extra income that they make from doing that, that sort of skim, they can then 
go into the market, mark up other securities and their inventory that they have. And as they mark that up, investors will end up buying it from those dealers at higher prices. And it's just a markup game. It's just a, simply a dealer game out there. If people understood that, they would they would start to realize, well, wait a second, okay, the Fed is starting to taper here. What does that really mean? Well, there's a committee that looks at you know the next three months of of uh, treasury needs and so forth, and they try to say, okay, this is what the deficits are going to be. This is what the treasury is going to need in terms of issuance and so forth. Well, there's an opportunity here that basically says that the economy is running a little bit hotter than normal, so tax receipts are coming in, everything's fine. You have Biden's program that's on ice right now, so you don't have the deficit spending that was that people were looking for. So that the the, the and, and not only that, the back in February of earlier this year, you had the U.S. Treasury buying paying back a lot of T bills or basically buying back T bills. So they were retiring T bills in the market. Well, the Fed created this. Uh, uh, re, uh, reverse repurchase program that soaked in all that cash that the, the U.S. government was paying in, paying out to investors that were holding these T-bills. And now that program is up to $1.7 trillion. Well, you have that big program, which is basically a slush fund that, that could come in and support the treasury market if the Fed doesn't buy the 100% of issuance. So the Fed's thinking, okay, we can tail back on the on, on buying more treasuries, even though the, the, the U.S. government is going to come to market with you know, a couple hundred billion dollars of treasuries over the next month or so. Um, we can step aside a little bit and let the market try to absorb this and make it look like we're tightening. But in, in essence, what they're doing is they're just, you know, they haven't really hit the, the brakes yet. They're just adding less money into the system. So they're giving, they're, and at the same time, they're trying to fight inflation or they're trying to show the attempts of fighting inflation. Um, and, and so they're trying to appease probably the fixed income market because the market's probably saying, why should I even own a bond? Because it doesn't make any sense with 6% inflation. So, so there's a number of sort of cards that they're playing in their hand at the same time. The issue is if if they cut back on the, on on tre- treasury issuance or buying the treasury issuance by tapering, and the economy starts to slow down next year at some point, um, the Fed if with that slowdown their tax revenues receipts start to dry up a little bit, um, and let's just say Biden gets another package through uh, through Congress, the deficits are going to start picking up again. They're going to be forced to the U.S. government's going to be forced to sell more treasuries into the market. Now, if the Fed doesn't want to absorb that, that's going to soak up liquidity really fast. And it, if it burns through that excess 1.7 trillion, it's in in the in the uh, uh, repurchase rep, uh, 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 reverse repo. Re, yeah, the reverse repurchase uh, program that they've created. Um, at some point, that's going to hit liquidity in the general markets, and with margin debts as high as they are. Um, you could start to see a cascading effect on the sell side of this market really fast. And, and that would be what they call a deleveraging effect, where all this leverage that has been built into the market starts to come out all at once, kind of like a, a March of 2020. Except in this type of situation, if the Fed or if the US government's coming out with more and more debt and the, and the, and the Fed blinks and says, you know, we're not going to buy all this right away, um, you could have, a, a, you know, not only equities come under pressure, but you could also have the US Treasury market or a fixed income market come under pressure and you could see yields start to really back up fast. And we saw that in March of 2020. So so the Fed knows all this. They realize that they can always come back to the rescue if they need to, but they're just trying, I think they're trying to play this sort of, uh, uh, we're in this little window of opportunity here that we can pull back, make it look like we're fighting inflation and hope that tax receipts don't start to dry up because we think the economy's got a little bit more life in it than most people think. That's possibly what could happen. Um, I just, you know, the problem you run into is you have geopolitical situations that could come out out of nowhere. You could have, uh, you know, event market events. You could have, you know, like you saw with the Evergrande and so forth. You could have anything come out of the blue out of nowhere and, and that start to have an effect very quickly. I mean, whether it's this COVID thing or whatever it may be, or the lockdowns that COVID's going to probably bring, it's not really the the, the virus. It's the government's effect uh, on uh, regarding the virus that, that really causes the, the the worry out there. So mm-hmm. when you take all that into into consideration, I think the market has enough liquidity to to sustain itself 
you know, for a little bit of time. But once those, once that, uh, once the treasury issuance starts to overtake what the Fed has been tapering down, and you start to see that widening effect of gap of of what needs to be funded by the general market, that's where the, the pressure on the general market could really come into play. And gold, oddly enough, I think is sensing all that. It realizes at some point you're going to have this risk off situation. Um, and I think that's why I think people got too short on gold over the last couple of weeks, three weeks or so. And they started to say, well, why should we even buy gold anymore? We're, we're you know, it's a perfect economy. Cryptos are going up. Everything's going up. The stock market's going up. Um, well, if you get into a situation where the treasury, if the Fed just you could truly have deflation or deleveraging and, and gold in a risk off scenario would act very well in that in that situation. Mm-hmm. Knowing that basically the 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 effect of all this, the the after effect, I should say, would be the it would have it would force the Fed and central banks to come back to the table and expand their balance sheet all over again. Mm-hmm. Like you say, it's just a unbelievably complex picture and there's so many different moving pieces that have to be taken into account here. So, Bob, at at what point do you think the Fed, like you say, comes back in and tries to save face and starts expanding their balance sheet again? Like, are they going to be hesitant to do that simply because they have, you know, signaled that they have to start fighting inflation? Well, I think I think the issue is how much would the market have to drop for them to feel the pain? Um, Mm -hmm. Because you not only have it's not necessarily just asset levels and the Fed wants to create you know a utopia and wants to have assets always go up. The issue is you have pensions that are underfunded, you have municipalities that are dependent on tax revenue. They're, you know, the capital gains uh, uh, tax revenue has has become a very material amount going into the treasury's coffer. So that could be affected. I mean, there's so many different types of things that are now dependent on high asset prices. Mm. Um, and so it's, and that's where I think the younger generation is starting to feel the pain because they're saying, well, how can I afford a house? I mean, priced out of the market on everything. And so t- to me, um, I think at some point you're going to have this, you know, the, the pure to high prices is high prices. You're going to see this wall that gets hit that, People just can't afford it anymore. Kind of like the the gold and silver market in June of this year, the premiums were so high they just started backing off. Mm-hmm. And and I think we'll probably have that next year. I think that there's a good chance that you're going to see a market dislocation. Um, you have you, you if you look, all you have to do is look at uh, Microsoft and and some of these stocks that have just gone straight up. I mean, it's not a very sustainable pace uh, that these things have happened. And then of course you have. Billions of dollars have been sold by Elon Musk and you know some of these other insiders that are getting out. I mean, there are signs all over the place. It's just the question is now the party is it's it's you know it's near the end of the night. You know, last call for alcohol. You know, the the, the Fed is is pulling the punch bowl, so to speak. They're still giving it out, but it's 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 getting really late in in the innings, so to speak. So, I think you have to, as an investor. The question then is, okay, where do I go? What assets haven't participated in this massive ten-year bull run? And that's where it's interesting that the, you know, especially silver, hasn't. It's nowhere near its all-time highs. Um, and you know, the question is, okay, if the markets took a took a beating, would actually the metals go up on a risk-off scenario, anticipating what the next move from the Fed's going to be, not necessarily react to the general market sell-off? I mean, we we've, we've seen some of these sell-offs where the metals are the only thing up on the day, um, and I think that's possibly that that could actually start to take place because you've seen this, and I've talked about it before, a massive deleveraging over the last year and a half in. The futures market and uh, banks getting out of the 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 trading business and so forth. The Basel three scenario where they've backed away from a lot of this leverage on their balance sheet. They realize that they're trying to to play it more safe as well. Um, and so, I think the market set up that you may not see this 2008 crash in the general markets and everything else, the metals, everything else goes with it. Uh, I mean, it, it could for a very, very short period of time, but like we saw in 20 March of 2020, it'll come back uh, you know, w- with a storm. And I think that's, you know, we saw that with the dislocation between COMEX and London. Mm-hmm. That was actually going to be my, my question that kind of popped into my head 
when you were explaining that, Bob, is, you know, considering that we have all this leverage as well in the in the paper markets or or apparent leverage in the paper markets, um, if if that would have an effect. But you're saying that demand could come in and that le- a lot of that leverage has been removed in those paper markets now, right? Yeah, I think if you look at um, ETF flows and so forth, they've been pretty dormant. Um, mm-hmm. You've seen, I, I did a, a presentation at the Silver Symposium, which I showed how activity in the futures market is, which was in a very steady upward channel uh, since 2008 to, you know, up till basically COVID Mm -hmm. um, crashed and broke that uptrend channel. So Mm -hmm. you've seen a a deleveraging in in that realm. Banks obviously not being incentivized to borrow or to to create these unallocated sort of leverage programs because now they're having to raise, uh, they're having to come up with reserves uh, to, to, to fund these programs, whereas before it was just a complete leverage game. Um, so so you, you see um, less, and of course you see the, the, the metal that's on the COMEX now, um, you're seeing it's not a hundred to one paper ounces to, to physical ounce ratios anymore. Like we saw you know, even 300 to one back in 2015. I mean, these ratios like on silver is seven to one on gold. It's like three to one. It's not, you, you, you have a lot of metal there. Um, uh, so if people do want to start taking, you know, th- th- I don't think there is much as there's not as much uh, gamesmanship that's going on. Yes, there's, the speculators are always going to get the rug pulled on them, and the and the commercials are going to short as as the prices go up and as speculators, uh, uh, you know, they they go head first into owning uh, or going long futures contracts. Yes, you're going to always have that that rug pulling event, but I think you don't. That's not the. I think the market structure has gotten a lot sounder since since 2015. Uh, uh, so that I think that's a positive, and I think that's where people start to realize. Well, wait a second, if we start to see inflation after this, you know, say you get a market dislocation, and then you start to see the money printing cycle happen all over again. The question then is, everybody's been to the rodeo already; they know what to expect. What mm-hmm. they don't realize is that. Um, the real world could actually that money could start flowing into other things or hard assets versus paper assets this time around that next time around. And traditionally, when when people get into a uh, a risk off scenario, they go with things they can trust, and in, it's human nature to go to physical things. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why I think at some point the 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 the, the gold and silver will have their day in the sun. Uh, it's just, but I think the problem is it's worn out so many people during this whole process. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just have to look at the price of gold relative to the Turkish lira. I mean, it's just gone vertical, uh, mm-hmm. but it, it it just bounced around forever. Um, uh, and then of course, hyperinflation, it, you know, that's what gold is for. It's to maintain your purchasing power. Yeah. It seemed to happen very slowly and then all at once. Right. And, and that yeah. situation in Turkey has just, like we were talking about before we hit record here over the past month, it's just gone exponential. And it's, it's hard to think that, you know, looking back a month ago that the situation was what it was and where it is now. Right. Yeah. And and if you look, go back to 2008, you always look for a country that could be the poster child for, I, I know the media likes to do this, but becomes a poster child for whatever market event happens. And mm-hmm. it was Ireland or not Ireland, but Iceland is the one that was sort of uh, looked at as the real estate bubble blow up and and, and and everything stemmed from there. But of course, we all know that wasn't the case, but that's how it's perceived. Well, Turkey could be the poster child for this eventual inflation that's going to hit the system with all this money creation that's been created, that if that money started to go to world world assets versus the paper side, uh, you would have shortages everywhere. I mean, you're seeing that right now a little bit. And some of this is, you know, a little bit of production, a little bit of logistics, a little bit of social distancing. But you know, if you truly had just people say, "Listen, I don't care about you know what what's in my wallet in terms of paper currency um, or my bank account. I care about knowing that I have something that's going to retain value, kind of like what you see in a typical hyperinflationary type of state or a high inflationary type of state. Mm-hmm. I mean, owning a bond, yes, you're going to have your money back in five years or two years, whatever. But you've lost that purchasing power. It's just it's it's just destroyed the saver. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where um, I think that's that's something that I think investors are becoming more attuned to. 
Mm-hmm. Excellent, Bob. Well, you know, we, we've covered a lot here in that discussion. Is there anything else you think we should touch on before, uh, before we wrap up here? Um, I, I think that's, I mean, there's probably tons of other things, but um, I think, uh, uh, I think that gives enough, pe- en- enough of, of a pill to swallow this time around. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, of course, you're uh, available at Profits Plus ID on Twitter and goldsilvervault.com. You mentioned the um, silver ETF uh, presentation that you made, and we went over that on the on the last interview, but I can link to that in the show notes as well here. Uh, Bob, thanks so much for for your time today and uh, and your you know sharing your your knowledge with us all year here. I really appreciate it. Sure, my pleasure. And again, thank you for uh, having me on and I hope everyone has a happy holidays. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.